Hey guys, uh, Leaf Reed here. Uh, I guess this is October. I just wanted to do a, I don't know, I, I just want to talk about one very specific piece of media and content that isn't really even a piece of media. I didn't know, you know, I should this go my gaming channel or, or whatever. And I just thought I'd do it here and just talk about it because it's abstract, which is the back rooms. And again, the back rooms has been a thing that I think it started as like a 4chan post or something or Twitter or Tumblr or I don't know, whatever. And it inspired, a, you know, Kane Pixels to make a YouTube, you know, video on it and then a little series. And I guess I just wanted to talk about it. Why, what, what is it about these liminal spaces that make it so unnerving and really interesting and why I have some issues with its development as all things you know flow into the net someone takes it modifies it and makes it inevitably worse in some way so here's my take that the back rooms is a psychological metaphor for being lost and so I, I personally, <laughs> you know, I was lost in uh, shopping malls and, and uh, supermarkets and office buildings. I, I actually, I've been lost in the mall quite a few times as a toddler, once in an office building. And I think what's interesting about that state is that when you are, um, and it's also taking that aspect and combining it with, I would say, video game mechanics this idea that the back rooms is similar in a game when you clip out of reality it's this place that shouldn't exist you know it kind of runs on the assumption that reality is a simulation or a holographic reflection or a game itself and that you can possibly fall into the space between spaces where you get glitched out and this happens in games all the time intentionally sometimes and when you want to get out of bounds on a a single player map or a multiplayer map and you go behind the geometry where the developers never tended you to go and you see all the weird things that happen how the game breaks some of my favorite examples were definitely halo 2 multiplayer maps um you go onto the rooftops or these very secret hidden places i remember you had to like sword cancel your way <laughs> up it was so stupid but i loved it and so you end up on the rooftops and you see, and you start moving behind like these generators or these things on the rooftop or entire buildings and you can see through them because there's no textures on the back of them because they thought, well, you're never gonna be there. And it's this very abstract um, pseudo reality that you enter into. And it's this really cool vibe that I really like from games because games are supposed to be a well, a virtual reality. They're not real. They're, they're interpretations of, of real places and real events. And, 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 but it's supposed to be, but you kind of know it's fake, but it's approaching reality in a way. And so it's this whole um, feeling of kind of like a purgatory-like state where, yeah, you're in a place that's familiar, but not really. Um, another thing that people think of the backrooms as is kind of like the afterlife. Uh, you know, instead of just sending you to hell, it sends you to a place where you don't know if you're in hell or if you're in purgatory. You're put in this endless corridor, this endless hallway, and you have no idea if this is even your punishment, which is even more uh, bizarre, more callous in a sense. And so going to the back to the feeling of being lost when i was lost in these environments as a kid um when you are lost when you realize that a you are alone and two you don't know where you are even though you're in a human made space it's very unnerving and so i've personally experienced this and so that's why i i look at those videos and i know exactly or at least i feel I know exactly what it's trying to convey because I feel it where you are in a place that is uh, decorated and adjusted and created for human existence, but you remove the humans. 
And similar to getting lost in a place like a shopping mall, like, okay, yeah, there's other people around, but because you don't know any of them, they almost fade into the background, and all you can see is the general outlines and the, you know, the architecture and the vibrations of that place. And, and again, when you're a child, you, you don't know what's going on and your mind goes into almost like a trauma-like state or, you know, a, a prey-like state where everything that's familiar to you from the McDonald's sign to the, you know, the stairway and everything becomes foreign and hostile. It becomes large and looming and evil and you don't see any warmth in the world. And so when we look at these environments where they are devoid of the, you know, the kiosk desks and the fountains and uh, all the things that inhabit it and make it a livable space, the emotion that it's trying to generate is that, you know, this is a place where humans used to be. This is a place where humans could be, but they're not here, either because they left or they were forced to leave or that this place itself isn't real in the first place. And so it's, it, it's, it's interesting. It's like an uncanny valley effect where you have some human characteristics or some, you know, civilizational, um, uh, you know, uh, characteristics, but not enough. So your, your mind starts filling in the blanks or starts thinking, okay, this seems like people live here, but there's no one here. So it's very, very strange. And so it's the aspect, again, of, of removing, you're just removing stuff and to make it feel weird. And again, shopping malls are supposed to be these, um, for lack of a better term, a pinnacle of civilization. This is a place where you should feel 100% safe and also good. And, you know, they pump in extra oxygen, they have nice perfumes, they have music playing, and it's supposed to put you in an ideal mood to spend money, right? So it's supposed to be really, I mean, if you look at a shopping mall, it is the apex of that respective civilization. You know, if it's in, you know, the... Asia or Europe or wherever, your shopping mall basically reflects your highest state of being in, in a weird way. It's a reflection, again, of, your, of the human uh, soul or the zeitgeist or whatever. Um, this is who we are, essentially. You know, this is the most pleasurable public space that we could generate, essentially. And when you take away the human element, it turns into this weird dystopia. Because again, anything that's trying or aiming towards being perfect, when you remove the human element from it, or when it feels like there's something wrong, it feels like the opposite, that it becomes dystopian. Uh, I mean, that's the whole what the whole Fallout series is kind of based on, where you take the optimism of uh, the 60s and you turn it the world into ash. But you keep the idea. Um... And so these, these, you could argue, these holy places, these uh, supermarkets and shopping malls and places where you should feel completely safe, um, you know, I, a Dead Rising is a perfect example of this dichotomy of these, of these two opposite things. It's, it's much more um, stark and contrasted. Uh, you know, why is it in horror movies do you have young attractive actors because the dichotomy is is larger you know the um the difference of you know if 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 the serial killer was hunting a bunch of old retired people kind of like well you know they, they, they've kind of had their go you know they're they're kind of already waiting around to die so it's it's like it's not that bad but when someone's at the prime of their youth it's kind of like that is the worst time to die because they have their whole life ahead of them so again the more uh, not dissonant, but the more distance tonally you can put in a dystopia utopia scenario, the more unnerving it is. And again, when you feel, uh, y y you see a place that you recognize as a possible utopia, but it's missing its elements. It's like looking at a human body without its skin. It, it, it's just, or it's missing like 
its eyes, more likely. It, it's something smaller than that. If it's missing your skin, you're like, oh, okay, this is obviously awful. But it's more like looking at something that's 90% okay, or 90% blissful, and then 10% of it is not even wrong, just missing. It's like looking at someone and they have one eye. You're like, oh, okay, something is terribly wrong here. But because there's enough fantasy and mystique and utopia to keep you comfortable, you kind of stay in that environment without just saying, all right, this is a, this is a hell zone. This is some scrap metal yard in like Africa filled with rabid dogs and, and fleas and rotting flesh and something like the kind of Resident Evil 5. It's like, okay, yeah, obviously this is bad. But when... Again, when you have that contrast of a supposed paradise, it makes it eerie. And he said, is this bad? What's bad about it? You know, it's like looking at um, a painting or an image where you know something's wrong with it. Maybe there's like a, a tear or a color or something, but it, it, it's investigating. And it's a call for human investigation to look at as to what is wrong with this thing and why. And that's the whole concept of the back rooms is that you as the character are or as the main actor whatever you're going through this environment thinking there has to be a reason or there has to be a meaning or there has to be a reason why this place is how it is and it's that search for meaning which can go very well or very poorly and so you know i really like the episodes of the back rooms where you kind of go through these seemingly innocuous spaces and then you find one, just one random thing where it's like a chair in the middle of the hallway. And you're like, okay, did, did someone move it there? Is, does, does someone exist here? Um, is, is this real? It's, it's, it's spooky when you just find the small details. I think there's one where like they had some guy who is like turned to ash or something or like barely human like on this wall and he does there's no jump scares he doesn't get up he just lays there and you just like oh well, that's messed up and again even besides all that stuff I, i'll backtrack a little bit here i think that what makes the back rooms the best feeling is again the feeling of being lost the feeling of being completely disoriented in a place that is trying to make you feel as pleasurable and as non-disoriented as possible um, that's the dichotomy. That's the distance there. And so, you know, you go into uh, a shopping mall scenario. There's no plants, there's no trees, there's no people, no kiosks, no decorations. Uh, but maybe there's still music. It's even eerier because it, it's just the, the echoes or the vibe of the place. But it's not fulfilling its intended purpose. It's doing the opposite of that. And so as a kid, when I was lost, it's that feeling... That feeling of being lost in the in the in the in the mall is completely resonant with that experience. And again, um, this is why I'm not super big on the idea of like a monster or even other people being in the back rooms. The real uh, terror comes the fact that there is nothing. There's no monster. There's no other people, and there's no way out. It is the ultimate level of uncertainty. And like adding, you know, adding a monster is like, okay, I mean, that's kind of cool. It adds more anxiety. But just the idea that you're in a space that no human should really inhabit is that like an uninhabitable space, but it's still a reflection of, of a perverse reflection of reality is, is far more interesting. And so you kind of have to just wander and it's very I guess existentialist in that sense because you don't know if there's an exit you don't know if this thing goes on forever even though it seems it does you have no idea where you are and if you will survive and the, and the ultimate um, you know uh, terror of that is starving that you will eventually just die you will lose your energy you'll have no food no way to eat anything um, and no one to find you, no one to save you. Um, and it's funny because this entire scenario reminds me of my favorite, or one of my favorite horror movies of all time, which is The Blair Witch Project. And I don't know how many people have actually watched uh, The Blair Witch Project, but I was very taken aback by what 
the story was actually about is that yeah it's kind of about the Blair Witch but not really um about more than half I feel like more than half the movie is about three teenagers getting lost in the woods and there's really no um inference of anything supernatural until like near the very end even to the point where they think that the Blair Witch um you know happenings like you know the weird like there's some animal and there's some something inside the animal's mouth that there's one of theirs like they thought oh we're hallucinating because we haven't eaten anything in days or we don't know where we are and so it, it's kind of this like little game where like is this really happening or are they having hallucinations because they are just simply lost and so that's what that movie's about and again I think uh the other thing I love about that movie is that the actors are so realistic. Like, I was looking at them thinking, those look like people I know, and they act like people I know. Like, that's real acting in, 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 in my field because they, they don't feel like actors. They don't feel like actors at all. They feel like nobodies, which is more uh, compelling and strange and unnerving. Like, it doesn't, and of course, it doesn't have a big Hollywood production, and yes, it pioneered that whole act of you know handheld horror movies which you know were replete with jump scares and again i don't think there's a single jump scare in that movie even though it's from the like the the whole first person perspective uh it, it, it it's it's a work of art it's 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 beyond a horror film it's it's really a psychological thriller if anything and uh yeah i don't really like you know traditional horror movies i like thrillers and so it's that same idea, it's that same vibe of disorientation of, of man versus nature almost, or man versus environment, where the environment, you know, is, is just foreign. It's familiar, but it's foreign. And the worst, oh, probably my, the worst things in, in the backroom scenario or any of the scenarios is when... Oh God, it, it, it gets me so bad where the character's been walking in a certain direction for, you know, quite a while and they remember a landmark they passed and they come into the clearing or they come into the back rooms or whatever and they find that same landmark and they start freaking out saying, have we just been walking in... I'm getting goosebumps talking about this. Have we just been walking in circles? It's the feeling of being completely lost i don't know the fear of being lost is um i guess a trope that isn't done enough or talked about enough the the feeling of i don't know, just just being lost not knowing where you are not knowing the uncertainty of where you're going to sleep where you're going to eat if you can even eat anything um I don't know. It to me that is one of the most horrifying things because it's very, I think, realistic, very probable, and you don't need a monster or an antagonist to add to it. Really, it's it 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 just is what it is. Like you will die because you can't find your way back to civilization. You can't find your way back to anything. Uh, and again, it's the feeling of, I think it's similar stories, even like um, happy stories or hero stories. When you cross, uh, cross the threshold, um, you can't come back. And I really like that in um, other movies too, where like you are descending. Uh, the, the, the movie, of course, The Descent, which is uh, very strange. <laughs> like... It's a good movie, but the premise is, like, odd. And the premise, like, the premise is essentially, there's a bunch of uh, divorced or single older ladies who all go on a spelunking trip together, and they go inside this cave, and I thought, oh, this is going to become some kind of thriller where, like, you know, one of them falls and breaks her leg, and they have to get food and supplies, and... And uh, they find, like, Falmer elves and goblins in the caves, and they have to fight them in this epic, like, pickaxe-style, like, Tomb Raider almost. And I was like, 
okay. <laughs> um, just like, all right, sure, fine. We know, whatever. Yeah, there, there's, there's goblins in the woods. It was a little bit hokey, but <coughs> I was like, sure, I'm here for it. But again, I love the feeling of being cut off from the threshold, like having a hard stop. You fall into the back rooms or you fall down a hole or you go through this thing. Um, and again, I love how the minimalism of it, because it focuses on the characters, their development. I think it'd be interesting to see a Backrooms film where you have a few characters, maybe not, not a lot, maybe two, maybe three even, and they just have to work together to find out where to go, what to do, how to survive, who their leader is, if they can trust that person. Um, you know. And, and with the minimalization, the characters come to fruition it's almost like they're on a on a stage really and and the background and the all the details don't matter and the backrooms is the ultimate uh expression of that of the ultimate expression of minimalism in a space that should not be minimal uh or liminal in, in this case you know it's liminal because there is nothing in it another movie that comes to mind as well that i think kind of fits the backrooms format is Cube, a uh, Canadian film that, very similar, I think, you know, some people argue, but I'm pretty sure it's a very direct metaphor for purgatory or something. And essentially there are, you know, uh, 10 or so people who wake up in this cube and it's a room and they can basically go to other rooms and they kind of slowly discover through the mechanics and inner workings of this cube world that some cubes have death traps in them, some of them have other kind of traps, uh, some of them are completely safe, and they just have to work together and just go through this weird environment. And again, it's like these torture chambers because, you know, they uh, you know, are being punished, essentially. Um, but they just show up here. And so you have to figure out, okay, why are they here? What's going on? What's the deal? Um, and so I think something like that with the backrooms would work really, really well. But even more so similar to, again, the Blair Witch Project. Because you don't even need characters dying. You just need... What the movie feels like is constant tension. Okay, this goes wrong. And then this goes wrong. And then this goes wrong. And then this character does something really stupid. And then they don't trust them anymore. And then this goes wrong. And so it's just constant building tension where you feel like you're with that group of people on the ride for a long time and you're rooting for them but you're also you're there with them but it, it's so tense and again i think that format of film would really suit the back rooms it's that feeling of again of isolation and, and lost and i'm sure gonna i'm gonna come up with something much more cohesive and profound as soon as this video ends but again it's that feeling of of anxiety and trying to stay calm when everything is going wrong slowly 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 and the stakes get higher you're hungrier you're more tired you're in a, and it gets up here and then finally someone snaps um again the the biggest monsters that you have to worry about are other people when they lose it Another thing I also like about the backrooms is just the different environments. Um, again, I don't like it when... <clears throat> I don't know, would I like... If, I, if, if there was a backrooms, would I want just one environment the whole time? I would, like, settle for three. Three separate, distinct environments that, you know, maybe, like, an apartment complex. You know, the, the yellow one, the original one, obviously. Um, and then maybe, like, an endless skyscraper thing or something I don't know um, and again I just love the feeling when you come back to a, a previous space but you're on like maybe the second floor or you're somewhere else um, I also love the aspect I was thinking of another movie contact where you know they get all this data this telemetry whatever from uh, I know the alien technology and they're analyzing it and they're like well we found this 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 and Someone interrupts, is like, well, what do you mean you found, you know, this? Uh, you know, uh, there's one video with, of the backrooms where they actually take uh, the tiles and the fluorescent lights of the backrooms and bring them back for analysis. 
and uh, you know it's like oh this bulb has the stamp of this American company on it and it has you know a manufacturer but there is no date for when it was manufactured so it's like okay at what point are these things entering reality so they and I love that too where um, similar to again another favorite horror movie of mine is The Ring is uh, like it just uh, the American version honestly frankly which is shocking is that she's so smart she takes the cursed tape and gets it analyzed in a lab and they have like an answer for, answer for why certain things can't be seen or certain things uh, appear the way they do and, and what not and again, it's it's about discovering those mechanics and the fact that, oh, if you show it to someone else, then they die. And so you have to turn into an urban legend and all this stuff. Um, but again, I love it how... I love how smart the characters are in that film. How they literally go through every logical step. It's like, okay, we're stuck here. There must be a way out. Or maybe there's going through the ceiling, going through the floorboards. Uh, you know, really just smart writing and then having an answer for everything that they would try to do. It's that low level focus on the character and the density of possibilities of the situation and what they're going to do. So, yeah, I've kind of just brainstormed a script for a backrooms movie, I guess, right here. But it is it is so interesting. And again, that that scene about you know when they're analyzing the the particles or whatever, I would love like to have a back and forth, similar to like. Uh, uh, what's it in like Ward from you know the Born Identity and and Pam, where you know they're, they're presenting their findings and you know you have the executive go like, what do you mean it was made in my American company? I thought this was some kind of alien netherworld or <laughs> stuff like that, and it's, I think it reveals just maybe something about myself that, um, you know, in, in, so I think David Fincher said this that in his films. It's all about the revelation. It's all about following this trail of information and knowledge to a distinct outcome. And you don't know what it is, but you follow the mystery. And the mystery guides you and brings you. And as you discover how the world works, how the backrooms uh, work, how mechanics work, whether or not there's monsters in there or not, or you just sort of worry about your other teammates, um, I think the best thing that uh, I saw recently was that he, he went to a certain point where he was by a wall and you could hear someone talking. And so he starts talking at the wall saying, hey, can you help me? Can you help me? I've been walking through here for ages. And goes like, you know, is this a prank? Who is this? Like, if you were the you know, Dubois kids, like, get out of here. And he ends up, no, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm trapped. I, I, I'm, I'm on the other side of the wall. I, I don't know if I can get through. And so the guy's like, okay, well, hold on. You know, it's like, okay, well, are you in my walls and stuff like this? And so he and he can hear him, and he sounds like he's on the other side of the wall, but he also, like, knows that he's not because, like, when he's tapping on, when the guy taps on the wall, he feels no vibration. So the guy's like, okay, hold on, I'll open up the wall. And when he does that, all you hear is his screaming. And so even though they're not in the same space... You, they can hear each other in the same space. So it's again, it's the perfect idea that reality breaks down and you're in this weird, broken world or simulation. And you don't know if you're there for a punishment or if it's just random, that there's no no reason for your punishment. No monster, no reason, um, no hope. And it's about just trying to make it through that. Yeah. Anyway, I, I love the concept of the back rooms. I don't think it's ever going to get a proper uh, Hollywood or, or whatever mainstream adaptation. They're going to screw it up somehow. It's just like how everything is screwed up now. It's, it's almost like we have to do it. Um, and I think Kane Pencils, I mean, th we wouldn't be here without him. We wouldn't even be talking about this if he hadn't bothered to uh, grow this idea a little bit more. Um, but anyway, that's, that's pretty much all I wanted to say for the spooky month of October. And, um, yeah, that's it. See you later, guys.